Maybe this, maybe the room is small enough. I don't think that this is, I'll just project, or maybe it is on. It is on. It is on. Okay. Well, I want to welcome everybody. Delighted to see you on a on a beautiful day when maybe you'd be outside and enjoying this uh, beautiful spring day. My name is Frederick or Fred Logeval. I am on the faculty here at the Kennedy School. I'm also in the history department and I'm a historian and I've written a fair amount about the war in Vietnam. <laughs> probably why I was uh, asked to come today for this session on how the Vietnam War continues to shape US-Vietnam relations. I think we all know that the war had an enormous, uh, a deep impact on international affairs, obviously on bilateral relations between the United States and, and Vietnam, but uh, a very important uh, effect on the Cold War and international politics, but also has had this extraordinary legacy, which is more to the point of our gathering today. That's what we're gonna be talking about. What I'm going to do is be the moderator. What is that? Um, I've got the talent here to my left, but I'm going to moderate. I'm going to introduce our panelists in, in a moment. Let me just make a, a, a couple of announcements first. And the first of those is that the Ash Center would like um, to recognize the, the, the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. I also wanna note that the event's being recorded. And it, it, so if you have somebody who couldn't make it, or if you're just so enthralled that you wanna see it again, <laughs> um, it will be up on the Ash Center's YouTube channel uh, shortly. And third, uh, in the Q and A, uh, if you want to pose a question when we get to the Q&A, if you would please wait until a staff member comes with a microphone, I think especially for the for the recording, for the YouTube, uh, it's good to have a mic as we proceed. So I want to introduce our panelists in the order in which they will speak. They'll each speak for about 10 minutes, which will then give us an opportunity for some robust discussion involving all of you. Um, and really look forward to that. Um, Q and A is often the, the best part of these um, uh, affairs. And so we wanna make sure we have time for, for discussion. Our first presenter uh, is Tim Reiser. Reiser, my, my apologies. <laughs> Listen, with Logaval as a surname. <laughs> uh, Everyone always. I'm, I'm not sure my family even knows how to pronounce it. <laughs> Tim Reiser. Uh, worked for the Senate Appropriations, Appropriations Subcommittee uh, uh, on the Department of State and Foreign Operations for 35 years, and as Senator Patrick Leahy's senior foreign policy advisor throughout that time. Previously, he was at Harvard Law School in terms of the negotiations project, so he knows this neck of the woods. And before that, uh, he was a public defender in Vermont. He graduated from Dartmouth College we won't hold that against them, 1976, <laughs> and from the Antioch School of Law in 1979. I want to just mention um, a brand new book some of you are familiar with called The Long Reckoning by George Black, which is an amazing book. Uh, it's just out, and in which Senator Leahy and Tim uh, feature prominently in terms of the, the work that they have done. Uh, and of course, Senator Leahy just retired after a long and distinguished career in the Senate, but the work that they have done in terms of this bilateral relationship, uh, the part that they have played in helping to heal the wounds of this war, quite extraordinary. I think we'll hear something about this today, but I love Senator Leahy's description of his longtime collaborator. He says of Tim, a dog with a bone. <laughs> dog with a bone, I love that. And what they've done, is channeled quite literally hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to Vietnam uh, in ways that are extraordinary, again, to help in so many different ways. I won't list them, but what an honor it is for all of us and for me in particular to have this opportunity to, to be on the panel with, with, with Tim. Second speaker is gonna be Hein Nguyen, uh, who I've had the privilege of getting to know over the last several years. 
Hai is the co-founder and the director of the Global Vietnam War Studies Initiative um, here at the Ash Center. Um, and his works uh, are too numerous to list in terms of the approaches that he takes, but the oral history project that Hai has really taken on over the last several years is an amazing, it's, it, it already is amazing, and it will become more so as he continues to work on this. In my class in the college on the war in Vietnam, Hai has appeared as a guest and he has shown little clips, little snippets of these oral histories to my students. And they are just breathtaking. The students always say to me, it's the highlight of the course when Hai has presented these and his work in really creating a kind of new di digital archive of, of sources, Vietnamese, original Vietnamese sources uh, is, is extraordinary. Um, his work has been published in various uh, important uh, publications, the Cambridge History of the Vietnam War, the New York Times, among other publications. And he is really looking to use digital humanities in a sense to further the work involved in in uh, understanding this war and understanding the legacy of the war. He has a PhD in history from Texas Tech. And uh, as I said, is now here at ASH. Our third speaker, Tim Koronek, is a professor of sociology at the University of Utah <clears throat> with a PhD from the University of Washington in Seattle. Since 2017, she has directed the University of Utah Asia Center, which is a Title VI National Resource Center for Asian and Pacific Studies. Um, and through her international scholarly engagement, Kim has been a senior research fellow at um, the Asia Research Institute at the, University, uh, the National University of Singapore. She's also been a, a, a visiting research fellow in, in, in Thailand. And she conducts research, research that addresses aging and the life course international migration and health and morality, especially among migrant and conflict affected populations within contemporary Asian societies. Um, delighted to have all of you with us, delighted to have our panel uh, uh, here. And I'm now gonna turn this over to Tim for his remarks. I am amazed that anyone would come here on a day like this. So <laughs> I really appreciate it. The fact that you're all here, that I have this chance to talk, and I and I really also um, hope we have time, enough time for questions, because I I'm really interested in in hearing what you all what what interests you about Vietnam today. Many of you probably have family, but not all. But I just it's really useful for me to hear what particularly younger people are interested in when it comes to um, the relationship between the U.S. and Vietnam today. As someone who lived through the war time, like Senator Leahy, uh, I knew people who um, uh, fought for the American side, and I've met others who uh, were on the Vietnamese side, both North and South. Uh, I could have been drafted myself. I was 18 in 1970, so that was really the, the height of the war. Um, I was very lucky, and from my perspective, I got a high lottery number at that time, the, the draft had become this, this system where they pick numbers out of, a, out of a barrel. And if your birthday was a certain number, um, you either were drafted or not. I was very lucky. My number was high enough that I was never at risk of being drafted. But, um, but the war had a huge impact on all of us. Whether you were sent to Vietnam or enlisted and in the military or in some other capacity, um, or just observing it and witnessing what was happening every day on television. It impacted us in really profound ways that in my case, and I think the same with Senator Leahy, really anyone uh, who experienced that have not ever forgotten. And, and for us, I think it was, in our view, a catastrophe uh, for both countries in, in so many respects it would be hard to list. Uh, but I never imagined that I could ever find myself in a position where I could actually do something about what had happened. And so for me, it was really a lucky coincidence that I ended up working for Senator Leahy, that he got himself reelected 
seven times. So he became the chairman of the Appropriations Committee uh, and that he cared about what had happened uh, and enough to want to go to Vietnam and begin to get a sense of, of how, how we could begin to rebuild our relations with, with Vietnam. And, and what, we, what we decided, what became clear from the very beginning, and this was during the first administration of George H.W. Bush, uh, who wanted to do something to begin to reconcile with Vietnam, was that we should start by addressing some of the most acute humanitarian needs. There were a lot of people who uh, had suffered very severe injuries from landmines, from unexploded bombs, uh, were missing limbs, had been crawling on the ground for 20 years, had no access to wheelchairs or, or artificial limbs. And so that was really what we decided to start doing. It was not controversial, it wasn't political, it was purely humanitarian, but it was a way that we could show that we weren't, we weren't just going to turn our back forever on what had happened. And that was the beginning of a program which today is administered by the U.S. Agency for International Development in eight different provinces in Vietnam. And it's going to be expanded to another two provinces where, where uh, the need is most acute. Uh, so we're helping people um, provide basically basic mobility and rehabilitation uh, to those who suffered permanent injuries of that type, which made it very difficult for them to support themselves, to support their families, and who were being ostracized by their communities because of their, um, their disability. That, over time, um, led to, and I had many conversations with Vietnamese officials, Senator Leahy and I went to Vietnam multiple times, and each time we would find ourselves, even though we were beginning to understand each other and build some degree of trust uh, that the issue of Agent Orange was one of huge resentment and anger on the part of the Vietnamese that, that the United States had done this and had done nothing to try to help those who had been very severely affected. And it took a while for us to convince our own government uh, that this was something that we should take on, uh, that like the problem of unexploded bombs, we could potentially turn what was an issue of real anger um, into one of cooperation and appreciation. And, and you know, we had, I had many arguments with the lawyers at the State Department and the Department of Defense, uh, but ultimately we were able to reach agreement that this was something that we should do and that there were two aspects to it. One was cleaning up former U.S. air bases that had been severely contaminated with dioxin, which was uh, part of the chemical construction of, of Agent Orange uh, and was causing, it became pretty clear to us, some of the most severe disabilities um, of people living in those areas. And also to um, both, as I say, clean up those places, which end up, ended up costing us hundreds of millions of dollars, but which really brought both our our um, diplomats and our uh, the people from both our Department of Defense and the Vietnamese Ministry of Defense together in ways that they never would have otherwise in a humanitarian undertaking that was really important to the Vietnamese and addressing the issues of disabilities of people with, um, with consequences from uh, Agent Orange, some of whom so severely disabled, even multiple generations that you know can't take care of themselves, can't speak, can't can't even get off the ground, and and so we are helping to address their needs. We also recognize that the Vietnamese had, for years, decades, helped us locate the remains of U.S. servicemen and women who who were missing from the war, uh, and without their help and support, we never could have found hundreds of Americans uh, uh, who were missing. And so just recently, we've initiated uh, a new project which is going to help the Vietnamese, both in terms of improving their DNA technology so that they can analyze the remains of, of um, missing Vietnamese. And also, um, like Dr. Hai, um, providing access to archival information, including 
um, uh, diaries and other artifacts that American soldiers brought home with them and which we are now making available to the Vietnamese so that they can help locate and identify the remains of, of some of their missing number in the hundreds of thousands. Another thing that we're doing is, um, and I don't want to take too much time. You may have taken, taken too much already. No, no, um, no. no. Um, in in um, uh, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, there's a museum, uh, which was initially uh, uh, called the American, uh, Tommy, you would know, War American Ordinance. War Crimes Museum, initially. It was all, all basically photographs of crimes, war crimes committed by the Americans. And, and you know, it's, it's actually one of the most popular tourist sites in Vietnam. And so we felt that, that it was important to also tell the story of what's happened since the war and how both countries have worked together to address what was done in ways that has really brought both countries together. And what we found, and that is now beginning, we have someone from the Smithsonian Museum helping us. And um, uh, we're hoping that it will, you know, it won't, it won't erase what happened. Nobody has any intention of wanting to do that or doing that. It's rather to show that there's more to the story, that the United States did not just walk away from this situation. Rather, we found ways to work together and rebuild our relationship. And now these types of humanitarian programs have really been what have, has opened the door to cooperation with Vietnam in a whole lot of other ways. Security cooperation, um, relating to the South China Sea and freedom of navigation, um, issues of uh, climate change. Uh, Vietnam is very vulnerable to uh, uh, climate change. The projections are, are pretty dire um, if the sea levels rise as anticipated for Vietnam. So there's a real urgency and there are ways that we can help uh, work with the Vietnamese to address it. Um, public health, preventing the next pandemic, trafficking in, in um, um, uh, wildlife. There's a whole range of higher education uh, and, and people here are involved in, in uh, the Fulbright University and in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, so, you know, what we've found is that by addressing the acute humanitarian problems that were legacies of the war, we really were able to turn issues of real um, hostility into areas of cooperation and appreciation. And now, you know, what we've always found is that when we go to Vietnam, Vietnamese are the most welcoming people that we meet anywhere. Um, they really appreciate the work that we're doing together. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we're now trying to look forward and look for ways that we can build on this, these initial uh, ways in which we have found to cooperate and um, build a, a much stronger and, and more comprehensive relationship at a time when, frankly, we need all the friends we can get in that part of the world and where we have a lot to offer Vietnam and we have a lot to learn from Vietnam. So I think I'm gonna stop there. Thanks, um, and happy to answer any questions about anything. Hey, hi. The, the, the floor is yours. Thank you for everyone for your coming. In, the, in just 10 days, it will be the April 30th, the historic day of the fall of Saigon in the 1975. Despite almost a half centuries having passed since then, the Vietnam War and its enduring legacy continues to be a significant factor in past U.S.-Vietnam relations. It is my great honor to present to you today the ancient legacy of the Vietnam War project and its contribution in the deepening the contemporary U.S.-Vietnam diplomacy. The my presentation will cover four key points. First, I will brief the Vietnamese war death situation. Second, I will clarify three missions of the, our work. Third, I will update you on the latest outcomes of the project. 
And lastly, I will highlight the contribution that this project had missed. About the Vietnam Middle War death situation, to note that during the Vietnam War, 70% of the North Vietnam Middle households had at least one or two children in the army. On the ground battlefield in South Vietnam, at least six North Vietnam Middle soldiers died for every UN combatant. To this day, over 20,000 revolutionary combatants killed in action remain missing in the Southern Vietnam. And while the 3,000, 300,000 remains had to recover, they have yet to be identified. Repatriation, the repatriation and identifi identification of the war deaths erased again the time. This situation creates political and humanitarian pressure on the Vietnamese government. In July 2021, both the UN and Vietnam governments signed a memorandum of understanding to support the Vietnam Middle Wartime Accounting Initiative. And the Harvard Art Center were chosen to lead the effort in fighting, archiving, and sharing the missing data of the Vietnam Middle War deaths and beyond. This project stands out from other war legacy programs in its people center approach, covering various aspects of the research and contributing to the US Vietnam relation in the many areas. We have a three complementary objective in our mission. First, the project is the first uh, systematic review of documents from the multiple sources in the US and Vietnam designed to facilitate the location and identification of the Vietnam Big War deaths. Uh, a key piece of material and published captured document that a few documents. Written in native to Vietnamese language that were collected by the US and its ally during the war. As you see some of the image from the capture document, including to military or the political report or a similar group schedule of the burial site from the North Vietnamese soldier. This collection contained millions of pages of entire information that would shed light on the fate of counselor Fallon Soldier of the people. Army of Vietnam and the National Liberation Front Armies, providing researchers with a deeper understanding of the war and its consequences. Second, the high value information on the Vietnamese war deaths is provided to the US Department of Defense, along with personal ephemeral and verified documentation to offer closure and healing to Vietnamese families. And thus, the primary sources available are the vast, but and duty. We have to organize, categorize, and index the capture document along other sources to create an advanced digital archive that promise to enable future scholarship and study of the war. To achieve this goals, your huge challenge for many reasons, but our research team have produced significant results so far. From the May 2022 until now, we provide this five set of deletable, which included the 48 research reports in the both English and Vietnamese. <clears throat> this report contains specific information on 39 individual war death case and potential burial site for almost 1,000 identified felon soldiers. And two weeks ago, we uh, went to Hanoi and uh, did um, Senator Zeb uh, Makri, the last uh, congressman, uh, congressional uh, delegation to visit Hanoi. And he hand over the, our latest deliverable to the General Phan Van Zan, Minister of the National Defense in Hanoi. The deliverable provided uh, previously and seen the burial site map, personal background, that's the that's the circumstances, rep coordination, and present the burial location. We discover, um, we also discover and return several individual ephemeral to the original authors who are a veteran and still alive today. We also donated a number of rare and valuable material relating to culture and history 
to local authorities and institutes. Uh, we uh, visited uh, Hatin province uh, to visit the Nguyen Juro Museum. And as you see, the um, Nguyen Juro, very famous uh, poet in Vietnam, and he's uh, he often known as the father of Vietnamese literature. <coughs> and he epic the poem Nguyen Gio, in the country, the most famous work. And you see the picture on the wall uh, in the Juno Museum, the North Vietnamese solo with the Nguyen Gio on Ho Chi Minh 12. And we found out at the notebook of the unknown solo, he wrote about a Gio on the battlefield. You know that one side he explained about how to use a weapon. And one side about a kill, like a piece of war. And the professor told me to uh, hand over the notebook to the party, the leadership, and they very appreciate you know, our nation. About a contribution, the project provided information on the Fallon Assault, how to have a significant contribution and impact on the fostering the mutual trust and cooperation between the US and Vietnam in various areas beyond its humanitarian collaboration. First, we support efforts to identify Vietnamese borders by providing a reliable protocol were developed for the gathering, analyzing, verifying, and providing authentic information to help the Vietnamese agency to expedite the researching and recovering process as well as the forensic DNA analysis for the remains of the fallen soldiers. Last year, uh, we went to the Quang Minh province to meet uh, this uh, gentleman. He spent 30 years to visit the more 70 the cemetery in the South Vietnam to try to find out uh, he the father the grave. Unfortunately, he got nothing until we visit his home and to give him the heat of father original the death notification. Very right. emotional story. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Second, we promote state diplomacy, people to people relation and cultural exchange. We provide opportunity were created for the US Vietnam state agency and the people to meet and understand each other better in addressing war legacy and other issues promoting dialogues and collaboration at all levels from the local to central authority. To the picture, you know, that the, the last week when we went to the Hanoi, we visited the Quang Chi province, we visited the Quang Bin, and you know that we have uh, many in the meeting from the central and uh, booking the level with the Vietnamese agency. We also visit about uh, General Zap, the family. Yeah. <coughs> Lastly, that we uh, continue to uh, contributed to inform the research collaboration. The project contributed to filling the gap in understanding of the war by providing the well-balanced perspectives, including the Vietnamese side. The first-hand accounts of the digital archives are a go to mind for scholar, student, and policy maker, offering insight into military strategies, political operations, international and domestic relation, local history, human being story, social and economy condition during the war time. These efforts are important in establishing sustainable center for collecting, training, and researching the war and its legacy from all sides. You know, rather than me drawing the conclusion, I would like to extend uh, an invitation for you to hear the voices from the Vietnamese side, both from bottom up and the top down perspective on the outer process. This picture of a very famous uh, the little <laughs> family, a female warrior who took the bite of Phan Thuan uh, on the September 21, 1965, after Mr. Nguyen Thi Kim Lai. A 17-year-old local guerrilla in the Hattin province captured the American pilot William Robinson. Robinson. The picture symbolized the asymmetric war between insurgency and counterinsurgency and the Vietnamese revolutionary heroism. In the 1995, Mr. Robinson visited Vietnam to meet the Miss Lai again, and they become friends. Mm -hmm. This lady is now 80 years old and living in the Hattin province. 
and the wizard that met her the one week ago, right? So, and we interview her. <laughs> Nam là cái dự án của đại hoa vận như thế này và cái dự án này là làm cho mối quan hệ về ngoại giao quốc phòng ngày càng chặt chẽ hơn và đặc biệt là ngoại giao nhân dân đảng chính phủ việt nam nhà nước việt nam khi mà thấy có một cái dự án như thế này và phía mỹ đã chủ trương để mà làm cái dự án này for being here. It's a real honor and pleasure to be part of this conversation. So knowledge of the American Vietnam War's enduring harms has long been very one-sided. Observing the dearth of research on war's aftermath for Vietnamese soldiers and civilians, sociologist Giovanna merely suggested back in the year 2000 that it reflected Americans' regard for the war as, quote, essentially an American drama because of a dehumanized image of the enemy created by the US political and military climate of the time." Unquote. Fortunately, a corrective to this one-sidedness has been underway. I think we see it in the panel today. Scholars working in Vietnam have begun to establish clear associations between dioxin exposure and severe mobility, disability, cancer and respiratory illness, and neurodevelopment in children whose parents were exposed. Others document mortality and morbidity due to UXO and call for measures to reduce risk and alleviate livelihood challenges where UXO still scars the landscape. Notably, the accrued injury and suffering through war remnants embedded in the landscape and in toxins in parental bodies is transgenerational in nature yet they are the proverbial tip of the iceberg with a far larger set of psychological and physical morbidities remaining hidden. They are obscured in part due to limited records on war exposure and health conditions, and also because they have yet to manifest in older survivors' experience of chronic disease. War psychological harms have also been elusive because of the silencing of veterans' post-service memory. We see glimpses of war psychological harms in Vietnamese literature, uh, most well known perhaps being Bao Ninh's The Sorrow of War, which many have read, they're familiar with um, Vietnam and the post war. Reflecting on his post war existence, Ning writes, quote, The soldiers who survived returned to the North as victors. They were hailed as heroes by the government. But he himself came back devastated, he admits. He goes on to say, quote, each day brought new nightmares. Even my parents feared me. I was keen to forget the war, but it refused to re release its grip on me, unquote. However, there was no space to openly grieve 
or share grief, processes that are critical to healing. And one of Nin's fellow veterans pointed out in a 1995 interview, quote, it was not until the Bao Nin book came out that people knew about the horrors. He gave an accurate picture of what really happened there, unquote. But many veterans who related nonetheless reacted negatively to this book. As the same veteran um, asked, quote, why did Bao Nin write about the war so everyone could see its naked face, unquote. So in my work as a life course and health sociologist, I'm trying to expand upon individual accounts that we have, many of which have been hidden or kept silent to deepen understanding of war's enduring consequences among aging survivors in Vietnam. So, so I talked about one-sidedness. These, none of these faces have been part of that side. Um, and it's time to kind of correct that silencing. I've tried to expand upon these individual accounts, many of which have been hidden or kept silent to deepen understanding of war's enduring consequences among aging survivors in Vietnam. Through the VHAS or the Vietnam Health and Aging Study, my colleagues and I are trying to answer a series of questions. Which groups within Vietnam are still bearing the burden of war in their experience of chronic disease? and accelerated aging? How are they coping? What do they need for better coping? How can we intervene to lessen the physical and psychological wounds experienced by those injured and traumatized by war? So there's an, an urgency to this work. Um, I think we all know this on the panel. As time is literally running out to study and understand war's consequences in this important population. Life expectancy in Vietnam is just over 75 years at the present time. Those who were aged 20 in 1965 turned 75 in 2020. So time is of the essence. Furthermore, the burden of disease has become tremendous in Vietnam. With individuals suffering from chronic illness for over 15 years of life on average, and the bulk of caregiving falling heavily upon their children and grandchildren. So if war exacerbated their parents' and grandparents' disease and disability, which our VHAS and other studies clearly demonstrate it has, then it represents another pathway through which war's toll is still being felt by Vietnam's younger generations. So the Vietnam Health and Aging Study is kind of coming out of um, theories of life course and embodiment to clarify how war's adversities, quote, get under the skin and either accumulate insults to health or in some cases yield resiliency. As life course sociologist, Colin Elder, who analyzed the disruptions and discontinuities that resulted when war came to men's lives who were engaged in US military service in World War II has written, quote, wars require an element, wars acquire an element of immortality through their imprint on survivors, or has eventually come to an end, but their consequences um, in lives continue. And epidemiologist Nancy Krieger writes, quote, history is vital because we live our history and body. We cannot understand our biology apart from history. We live as our phenotypes, which are our embodied history, unquote. And biological anthropologist Patrick Clerkin extends Krieger to global armed conflict settings, noting that when war is one's historical context, its extreme adversities may become embodied, getting under the skin for fundamental biological reasons. So starting in 2018, with funding from the National Institutes of Health, my colleagues and I began the work of the Vietnam Health and Aging Study, or VHAS, um, to examine the enduring effects of wartime experiences upon the health and aging of Vietnam war survivors. VHAS has been a model of rewarding international team science in partnership with colleagues at Hanoi Medical University and Vietnam's Institute of Family and Gender Studies. Our project team jointly designed and implemented a massive data collection in 2018 with a follow-up in 2021 of the survivors to that year, most of them, 
um, interviewing and collecting the biomarker data of 2,447 older Vietnamese were the youthful combatants and non-combatants of North Vietnam. Participants were randomly selected from the four districts of Northern and Central Vietnam shown on the map here. And they provided information on their military service, diverse exposures to wartime violence and hardships, current family, health, social, and material conditions. Our publications to date document war exposure related elevated risks in Vietnamese older adults across diverse health domains, including cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, agent orange exposure as it elevates cancer and non-cancer respiratory disease, physical frailty, somatic symptoms, cognitive impairment, psychological distress, and symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Um, and I, I don't wanna go into too many statistical details. I'll dive into just one of the studies that we looked at. The, the slide is a little bit off there. Um, to elaborate just briefly on one of these health conditions, post-traumatic stress. From the VHAS, we learned that although most elderly experience few or no symptoms at this point in their lives, a subset of elderly experience persistent, low to moderate levels of post-traumatic stress. And post-traumatic stress is not just psychologically troublesome, it weakens health and can thus hasten death. Also, the VHAS has a sizable sample of women who were members of the military, as well as the youth shock brigades or Thaimines and Fong. And so we can have this opportunity to explore how gender um, affects the experience of war trauma as well as the experience of post-traumatic stress. We learned that exposures to violence are more strongly predictive of post-traumatic stress disorder for women than they are for men. Um, and you can see this in the in the graphs here um, and also here where we show certain exposures that we inquired about and a sort of predicted, statistically predicted experience of, of um, post-traumatic stress. So to close, I wanna share a couple of thoughts on the work of War Legacies Education and Program Building that I think I've learned through this project and my collaborations. First, it's not enough to simply document war experiences and associated suffering. That's a necessary first step, however. Next is the difficult work of translation. And by translation, I don't mean ling linguistic, but translation into moving findings to policy and clinical practice. The start, I think, is bringing scientists and clinicians across borders into scientific collaboration and discussion of sustainable and importantly equitable interventions to ease survivors' physical and psychological wounds and also to support their care caregivers. Second, it is critical to expand curriculum to fill um, many students um, in um, secondary education and post-secondary a pretty significant dearth of knowledge on the American Vietnam War. I've been making small steps in this direction in part with the assistance of Hai Nguyen. Um, so next week I will conclude teaching a year long course together with a connected class at Fulbright University Vietnam on legacies of the American Vietnam War from diverse perspectives. So connecting in a numerable number of times over Zoom over this year <laughs> at strange hours of the morning or night and also during a brief learning abroad trip to Vietnam. Students there. Um, our students have been learning together and conducting joint research projects, which often use oral history and other methods to convey untold stories of participation and resistance and persistent post-war struggles in intergenerational communication and mental health. Our American and Vietnamese students, even though they're about two generations removed from the fighting still see war legacies in their own families. And they've made really amazing connections um, and developed a real empathy um, through their, um, their joint work. Um, to conclude, I wanna draw a connection between the embodiment construct and um, a reference to the new George Black book actually, um, in which he says, quote, the truth of all wars is that they never really end, unquote. So Vietnamese Americans and Vietnamese Americans specifically are connected in this permanence. And this is a pow powerful basis for reconciliation some nearly 50 years after the war. War's imprint on biology transcends sides and interconnects participants. 
there is here then a foundation for reconciliation and learning, educating, and treating the enduring wounds of war. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and I just want to thank all three of you. What a what a marvelous um, set of presentations, giving us an opportunity now to. We have about 15 minutes, I think, for discussion. And while you're deciding, uh, and while the uh, if you want to indicate that you pose want to pose a question, we'll get a mic to you. Maybe I'll take the chair's prerogative and ask uh, an initial question of you, Tim, if I may which is one of the things that I think is so admirable about the effort that you and Senator Leahy pursued is that it, it wasn't about partisanship. And I guess I'm thinking about, we live in very partisan times. At the moment. Understatement. Understatement of the, of the day. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit to that. And, and maybe, maybe the question is simply whether you, found it nevertheless to be a partisan issue that you had to to overcome or was it the case that in washington people in both parties including lawmakers staff shared your sense that this is something that has to tr transcend partisanship can you speak to that a little bit yeah i think that for the most part it, it has not been a partisan issue oh, okay um you know it's more been an issue of why should we do this? Because many people who you know I deal with weren't old enough to remember the war and, and weren't affected by it, and it's ancient history for them. So, you know, in dealing with other staff, particularly, and it's really the staff that run the place, um, you know, I had to make the case for why we should still care about addressing the legacies of the war in Vietnam. Um, from so many years ago, and why that is important for our relations with Vietnam today. Um, and so, you know, generally we found that we had the support of people on the other side. Um, it was more an issue of convincing them that this was a worthwhile use of resources, uh, federal dollars to support people like Hai and others. Um, and, and, you know, on the whole, I think we were able to succeed in convincing them that there were larger issues at stake. Marvelous. Um, yes, right here, gentleman in the second row. Here comes the mic. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Nan Fan. Uh, and uh, first of all, I thank you for uh, all your presentation, uh, especially to uh, Dr. Hagen talking about the unseen legacy of the war. Uh, as a Vietnamese, uh, I fully share the sentiment of the old lady when she's talking about there's a need for closure to marry uh, the foreign soldier. I think uh, that's very important. So therefore, the project uh, that you are doing is very important. Uh, having said all that, I also feel that uh, whenever the Americans are talking about Vietnam War, whether of the war or the legacy of the war, you're talking only about half of the story. The only half you're talking about is still the Americans and the North Vietnamese. The other half is South Vietnamese. I'm glad that uh, Professor Kim has one picture of a South Vietnamese soldier. But usually, Vietnamese soldier, one of the key players during the war, was never mentioned. And one of the ancient legacy of the Vietnam War is that there are hundred thousand of South Vietnamese disabled soldiers still being mistreated in Vietnam, ignored, nobody paid attention, and there's still thousands of South Vietnamese soldier deaths after the war, nobody cared. Uh, and I also feel that what impact the U.S. and Vietnam policy is not just what happened during the war, but what happened after the war have a lot impact. Uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Vietnamese communist government after the war is a reconciliation with America and with the Vietnamese people during the first 10 years or so. Uh, its policy was more preventable uh, than uh, reconciliation. And then it invaded Cambodia. So I think that what happened, and also 
the number of people who were killed in the so-called Vietnam War, there, there were more people who were killed after the war than during the war. That's why I think that had a lot more impact. And usually, we don't talk about what happened after the war, just do only do the war. Uh, so my question is, uh, how many more years before we begin to discuss about what happened after the war in Vietnam and what happened to the South Vietnamese people? Whoever wants to take that, uh, well, I mean, I'm happy to, but anyone else? I'll, I'll, I'll say that my sense, at least in terms of the historiography, in the historiography and the scholarship that is now being done, maybe not so much about the period after the war, but if we talk about 1946 to 1975, so the, the French War and then the American War, is that scholars are beginning, perhaps belatedly in response to your point, but they are beginning to address this in the way I think that you would like to see. So maybe that's a sense, that's a, a hopeful sign in terms of what historians maybe in particular are doing, not only to focus on the Americans, as you say, not only to focus on the DRB, the North Vietnamese, but also the South Vietnamese. But... Uh, three days ago, uh, Professor Tony and uh, uh, us, you know, we visited uh, the secret revolutionary bay in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, before 1975, where they hide a weapon uh, during the date offensive to attack uh, residents of the place, the palace, right? And the veteran uh, shared with us his uh, real experience at the war in the Cambodia. And when I asked him about the uh, Vietnam War or American War, and he said that a civil war, 20 years of civil war. And um, I think you know, so far the, from the, our research, you know, we focused on the authors. We interviewed, we uh, interviewed uh, a lot of South Vietnamese veterans and to try to provide uh, a perspective on the South Vietnamese side. And, uh, about the incinerity of the process. Uh, during the we uh, work with the CDAP, we try uh, to figure out if we got to any information relating to South Vietnamese armies uh, we store, and we hope that someday uh, the US and the Vietnam government, they have a policy how to have the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese families uh, to locate, identify uh, the loved one to home. Uh, but I think, you know, from the academic activity, we have to show our outcomes, how we can have or shape or continue to know impact on the Vietnam policy from the Vietnamese side. That's very important. I would just say that I agree with the, the problematic nature of the silencing or not paying attention to the um, experience of Arvin or South Vietnamese, whether it's within the United States or in the US con or in the Vietnamese context presently. Um, the course that I taught with the Fulbright University, the students were very keen to wanting to capture all multiple sides and sought out um, ind individuals to interview. So that's you know small steps, but I think there's awareness, and I think it's it's a very acute awareness in the now second and third gener generation Vietnamese Americans who really want to you know, have those stories of their family members be known, um, whether they're in Vietnam or in the US. And I'd also just sort of add that I know that there are a handful of social scientists who are working with the Vietnamese American communities um, in California and also in um, Louisiana that are trying to look at trauma effects on, on health in those communities here, So, but not enough. Oh, I, uh, Jonathan Kempner from Winthrop House. I've been fortunate enough to go to Vietnam twice, strictly as a tourist, north and south, and I was struck by how little, if I experienced no resentment towards me as an American or any expression of anti-American expression uh, feelings. I saw the Ford Motor Company plant there and... Um, Tell me, that was informally, are there any surveys or can you give me anything more concrete to confirm that really 
the attitudes of almost all Vietnamese now towards America is positive and only positive, or was I just selectively uh, meeting people who were being polite? I can tell you in my own experience, uh, it's the former, as I have always felt um, welcomed and um, appreciated, whether regardless of where in Vietnam I was. So uh, I don't think it's unique to to yourself or uh, to where you the, the places that you visited. I think the Vietnamese have long wanted to move beyond the war and to reconcile with the United States and. And everything that I've experienced uh, affirms that. Um, so I, I don't think there's um, some undercurrent of, of resentment towards the United States, at least that, that, that I have seen. I would concur. I would also just say in response to what, what you said, you know, our programs are, are designed to address the needs of people throughout the country. They're not focused on the North, they're not focused on the South. Much of the funding that we're providing for the MIA program, one of the motivations for it is to be able to essentially help facilitate more reconciliation between the North and the South, because we know that that is a serious issue. But the fact is that we have made clear from day one that this is about locating and identifying the remains of anyone missing, whether a civilian, a Northern combatant, a combatant for the South, that, that this is about helping any Vietnamese family, regardless of what side they were on. At this point, it makes no difference as far as the, the need, and it's the government's responsibility, above all, to help bring closure to those families wherever they're from. Other questions? We have a couple minutes left. I see you down here, yes. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, so I had the opportunity to work in Vietnam this summer and I, none of my Vietnamese like young friends watched that PBS like show. Like people don't really talk about the Vietnam War for them, it's about like development, working, like innovation, tech, meta, like, I'm just curious, like, what is your vision for this project um, to engage with young Vietnamese people these days? Because I know, like, with the Fulbright program, it's a liberal arts college, very small, very selective group who kind of opt into this idea. So, like, what does the vision look like in the next five or six years to, like, share some of your research and findings? I'll just begin by saying, I mean, I think connecting to the young people's professional interests is really important. And um, demographic, I'm speaking as a demographer, but demographically, a really important shift underway is that there is this rapidly aging population will, which will face a, a whole slew of um, diseases of older adulthood. And so understanding the connections to the past and how <coughs> health and health problems and whether it's cognitive or mental mental health is linked to that experience, I think it can bring insight. Um, I know that the student, I think you make a good point about the FUV students being in the small um, select population, but I think um, on both sides, the students expressed that they really wanted to understand their grandparents' generation better. And on both sides, it was incredibly difficult to hear and have those stories conveyed. They weren't, they knew there were things that were troubling that they had experienced that were really powerful. Um, and, and, you know, both experienced that, that lack of communication. And so I think the research can kind of give um, ideas into um, how to have those conversations and develop better understanding across generations. I wonder, hi, if you or, or Tony, in terms of your efforts. Have you found the same? Because it's understandable in a way that the younger generation who are in their early 20s or mid 20s, they've got other things on their minds. And this is ancient history to them. And that's true of true of American kids, although it is interesting that Vietnam War classes in American universities continue to get very robust enrollment. So there's something about this war 
and the culture, the music, everything associated with it. But I'm wondering if you find also that Vietnamese young people are not as engaged maybe with, with your project as, as I You see, the, um, I found out that in the United States, or Western country, Vietnam was the dominated by the American experience no, no question. or the memories. And in Vietnam, I found out the young generation, a lot of people, you know, the Sindhu were ended in 1975, they still question about the war history because and the official history from the party to control everything, often sanitized. Yeah. And so the, uh, I found out, you know, the young generation in Vietnam, they don't want to study the war history from the official uh -huh. history. And they would like to study, they would like to find out the hidden memories and total history from uh, the all sides. And for example, from the Araka and the legacy process, like I said, we built up the archives and we found out a lot of untold stories from the capture document, right? And that is why I think that our program at Harvard, Global Vietnam Wars, Study Institute, and Ancient Legacy of Project, you know, we served for young generation, for future generation, not only the past generation. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and when I interview, you know, not only the veteran, but I interview the family member, young generation, how to connect a different generation, the thrust of the war and the move forward the future. And so, in the Vietnam, that situation. Well, I, I, I want to hear if any of the three of you have a final word, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap up because we're at the end of our time. Is there any? You have a, it's too big an issue to put in a final word. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think that that we have major differences with the government of Vietnam. That's obvious. We have very different forms of government. We disagree on fundamental issues, um, and we also recognize that. Vietnam has a long way to go to reconcile within itself. Um, in some ways, the government has reconciled more with us than it has with the people of the South. And one of our goals is to help to, in our indirect way, facilitate that because we think it's important. But we also believe that there are profound lessons to be learned from Vietnam, which our own government generally failed to learn. And we have a way of repeating our mistakes that have caused huge problems for us and others around the world. And there are lessons of Vietnam that, that we want through the programs that we are supporting uh, for the younger generation in Vietnam to learn and for more Americans to learn so that hopefully we can avoid repeating uh, anything uh, as catastrophic as that war. It's a good, good point on which to end. I'm teaching a class this semester and I see Two or three of my students in the room uh, in which the, the topic tim is precisely history and, and policy and and the failure of all of us but maybe especially our leaders to learn lessons from history history is all we have and so we know we're going to use history how can we use and understand history better that's the thrust of this class and your your, your, your comments speak to that profoundly i think what we've heard ladies and gentlemen or what I've heard is both how important the work that my three panelists, our three panelists, have done is just amazing, and also that work, more work remains to be done. So please join me in 